um, by popular demand, we have uh, placed this uh, 15 to 20 minute lecture at the outset today on ankle impingement. And I feel a little bit guilty about it because I have no real pearls to pass on to you. I will give you an overview of the problem. I do believe that the diagnosis is probably best made clinically and supported by MR imaging findings, but I don't think the clinical diagnosis is all that easy either. Basically, what we are looking for is some condition about the circumference of the ankle joint that is leading to a restriction in ankle motion, often associated with pain. Through the years, what started as a simple concept has expanded because virtually every single quadrant about the ankle has now become the source of uh, causes of ankle impingement, and various names have been applied to them, as you can see here. My plan is to kind of go through each of these quadrants, show you what people are talking about, and then at the end, suggest a concept and classification system that, to be honest, we do not use in our clinical practice. But it is something that may be useful for the future. Anterior impingement is a broad subject because it has uh, migrated from its original definition uh, to a broader um, uh, number of causes of restriction of ankle motion related to problems on the anterior aspect of the joint. And in fact, it's not uncommon now to use the term anterior impingement when there are osteophytes on the anterior surface of the tibia or adjacent talus, particularly, as I mentioned during this course, on the anteromedial aspect of the joint. So one could consider anterior impingement in any case of osteoarthritis of the ankle. The osteophytes uh, are generally well shown on uh, standard uh, images, uh, plain films of the ankle. These can be confirmed with MR imaging as in this case, and MR imaging may show associated synovial proliferation uh, adjacent to the osteophytes. But I think to call this anterior impingement would be to label that for every patient who has osteophytes on the anterior aspect of the ankle. And in fact, the purest definition of anterior impingement occurs uh, related to injury that takes place in soccer and is called footballer's ankle. The proposed mechanism is shown here with extreme plantar flexion. There is stretching of the anterior capsule and enthesophytes develop where the capsular tissue attaches to bone. There have been a uh, number of cases that have emphasized these outgrowths. Here's an example, the best I can do, in a soccer player, a 40-year-old retired soccer player who clinically had anterior ankle pain and the suggestion of restricted motion. And although this is certainly not the largest osteophyte that uh, we see, at least in this case, apparently it was causing restriction and there was a little bit of edema, as you can see in the lower image. There are some recent articles that have appeared in the sports medicine literature defining anteromedial impingement, this chart coming from the source at the bottom of the uh, slide. And again, it is emphasized it is anteromedial most of the time, not anterolateral. In this particular article, they suggested a radiograph, which I show you at the top, taken from the article, which was described as a 45-degree cranial caudal radiograph with 30 degrees of external rotation of the leg. And there were some impressive pictures in the article. We do not use this routinely in our practice, but I think with this position, we are emphasizing the anteromedial aspect of the ankle on the radiograph, and hence it is probably uh, valuable. In this article, as you can see from the table, they compared anteromedial impingement with another impingement syndrome, anterolateral, that we will discuss in a moment. We have seen examples where it has not been bone formation, but rather extensive synovial proliferation, as in this case, which clinically presented as anterior impingement of the ankle. Uh, 
There are some reports in the literature of the utilization of intravenous gadolinium first to define the extent of the synovial proliferation and then through delayed images to provide indirect MR orthographic contrast agent within the joint. Uh, I don't have any personal experience utilizing intravenous gadolinium or indirect MR arthrography, and frankly, I have very little personal experience with direct MR arthrography for this condition. The second quadrant that may become abnormal is the posterior, and here we have a lot of structures that may thicken or become associated with scar tissue following an injury. I remind you of all of those ligaments that are here, and you can see that these ligaments include syndesmotic ligaments as well as low lateral ligaments. Any of these may thicken and extend across the ankle joint in the posterolateral quadrant, creating ankle uh, impingement. Here's an example of what I look for if I'm trying to determine whether or not the strands of thickened ligaments might be significant. The main finding I look for is the effect of that uh, ligament thickening on nearby bones. And in my experience, the one finding that has been most helpful has been edema in the posterior aspect of the talus in association with a ligament that looks thick. Now this, of course, uh, could be related to acute injury, but I'm talking about patients who have had no acute injury but present with thickened ligaments. Here, for example, a patient again who clinically was touted as having posterolateral lateral impingement. I show you two levels on these axial images. This is the inferior transverse ligament, remember, one of the syndesmotic ligaments. And although not thickened, we were impressed that there was cystic change within the subjacent bone. And we also saw that that cystic change extended inferiorly adjacent to a thickened and irregular posterior talofibular ligament. So in a case like this, we would raise the possibility that this may indicate impingement. And another example, maybe not quite as convincing with regard to the inferior transverse ligament, but there is subtle edema involving the posterior aspect of the talus. Here, a little bit lower down, a thickened posterior talofibular ligament can be seen. The intermolecular slip, you remember a portion of the posterior talofibular ligament, may become thickened and extend across the ankle joint. If it does so, it too has been uh, suggested as a cause of posterolateral ankle impingement. I have no proven cases of that. This is the closest I could come. Clinically, I suspected impingement. This is what we found. We suggested maybe the intermolecular slip was thickened, but no surgery was done. A form of posterior impingement, we could consider it straight posterior impingement, is the ostrigonum syndrome. Now, as you know, this is particularly prevalent in ballet dancers because of the extreme plantar flexion required during some of the dance maneuvers. The size of the ostrigonum may help you, but it is not a real good finding because there are certainly cases of ostrigonum syndrome with very small ossified uh, uh, centers. So although we look for a large ostrigonum, it is not specific and a small one does not eliminate the diagnosis. With conventional radiography, it has been suggested that lateral radiographs done with extreme plantar flexion may be able to show you that there is a diminished space between the posterior aspect of the tibia and the talus. That in the presence of an ostrigonum as shown here, at least suggests that the os may be symptomatic. On MR imaging, there are a number of findings we may see, but I'm not sure any of them are specific. The, probably the best finding is the one shown here, which are the edematous changes present within the os itself right here and in the subjacent talus. In this case, it was associated with a, a synovial cyst. Note here, osteophytes, the anteromedial aspect of the talus suggestive of anterior impingement. Here's another example with very, very similar findings, a small triangular ostrigonum, but extensive cystic abnormalities. 
uh, evident on the uh, stir sequence. And another case, and this is probably the best uh, example of how much edema one can see, uh, very dramatic in this case, and this patient uh, clinically was believed to have the ostrigonum syndrome. Now, as you may know, the flexor hallucis longus tendon is intimate with the os uh, trigonum, and in fact, I mentioned that that os may impinge upon the tendon and damage it. But it is suggested that a secondary finding of os trigonum syndrome relates to the fact that tenosynovial fluid about the flexor hallucis may stop abruptly at the level of the os trigonum. Here's an example where we saw some fluid about the distal aspect of the tendon within the tendon sheath in a patient who clinically had ostrigonum syndrome. When we went ahead and did an axial section, we could appreciate the fluid, and there was very little fluid distal to the os. So this is secondary, but certainly not definitive evidence of ostrigonum syndrome. The next quadrant that uh, has been touted as a site of pathology producing impingement is the anterolateral quadrant of the ankle. Here the dominant players are the anterior tibiofibular ligament and somewhat lower down the anterior talofibular ligament. On this side, extending from the tib fib level to the talofib level is a gutter, sometimes called the anterolateral gutter of the ankle joint. And it is suggested fibrosis deep to a chronically injured ligament may lead to anterolateral impingement syndrome. We have a few cases that uh, would uh, document this. Clinically, again, a patient who had anterolateral ankle impingement, and there was scar tissue right here, pretty much at the joint line, but certainly within the anterolateral gutter. Another example of scar tissue within that anterolateral gutter adjacent to a thickened anterior talofibular ligament. So this is what we're looking for. I do not think the findings are specific. There was an article by David Rubin a number of years ago uh, indicating that the only true finding of anterolateral impingement was scar tissue shown here deep to a thick but otherwise intact ligament. And that by comparison, the finding of a torn ligament, as shown here, which is interposed between the fibula and talus, although clinically significant, should not be regarded as the pathologic finding indicative of this impingement. Now, I think that's a, uh, a nice uh, comment, but frankly, uh, I'm looking for anything in the anterolateral gutter, whether it be scar tissue or a thickened and displaced chronically torn ligament, I would think clinically both could produce impingement. On the medial side in recent years have been reports of impingement related to extensive scar tissue resulting from deltoid ligamentous complex injury. And we've had a number of these where there was a history of injury and the clinical question was, is there impingement on the medial side? This is an example of the gross disorganization of tissue on the medial side associated with edema within the medial aspect of the talus. And another one. This is very, very dramatic. Now, I could show you tons of cases where we see this, and I'm certain many of them do not have impingement. But if that is what is uh, you know, thought about clinically, then I think you ought to make a comment that the degree of fibrosis associated with the torn ligament is dramatic. And one further example, in a patient who did have clinically medial impingement at the level of the ankle. This was a patient who had chronic injuries, you can see on the lateral side as well. Note the edema, perhaps that being a secondary sign of impingement. And then the final pattern of impingement, which has been emphasized in a few cases, relates to syndesmotic uh, segment of the joint. This can represent scar tissue or synovial proliferation extending up into the synovial recess there. It can also be osseous in nature. Following an injury, one can see cases like this where there is extensive bone proliferation and a pseudo-articulation between the tibia and uh, fibula.
So trying to put all this together, I would say the following. I think ankle impingement syndromes are a clinical diagnosis supported by MR imaging findings that may indicate the source of the impingement. There are no definitive features, however, the only exception in my view perhaps being the Taylor edema that we see with posterolateral ankle impingement. But I think of this a little bit like an impingement ring. You know, we are talking about rings around every joint. So a number of years ago, I said, well, maybe this is the way we should think about it, that we can draw a ring around the ankle joint and number the hours of that ring in any way that you would like, but we would have in this case anterior 12, posterior 6, lateral 3, and medial 9. And if we do that, we can see the various quadrants around the ankle joint, and I suspect that impingement can occur anywhere around the ankle joint. Now, straight lateral impingement would be difficult because what we have there is simply the fibula. But if we had a malunion of a fibular fracture, probably it could exist as well. And similarly, straight medial impingement might relate to problems with the medial malleolus. So if we use that and add to it whether or not the cause of impingement is located at the ankle joint, above it or below it, we could come up with a classification system. And arbitrarily, I have a positive value for a lesion above the joint and a negative value for one below the joint. So if we look at a few cases, patients who clinically had ankle impingement, here, in fact, the cause of the impingement, we believe, was scar tissue about the posterior syndesmotic ligaments and about the posterior talofibular ligaments. And the scar tissue seemed to extend from the level of the ankle joint approximately to the level of the talus. So this could be posterolateral impingement, zero to minus two level, or another case. And this is the most common pattern we see. Here again, we see thickening of the syndesmotic and low lateral ligaments, particularly the posterior talofibular ligament. We would end up with a classification of posterolateral impingement zero to minus two level. Or one further example, this one where the main cause of clinically evident ankle impingement was marked thickening of the anterior tibiofibular ligament with extensive scar tissue, we could designate this anterolateral impingement at the ankle level or the zero level.